All right, we're live. So, we've been going through uh, spin orbit coupling, as you all are aware by now. Um, and we finally got all the matrix elements, I don't know, whenever, last time maybe. Um, I guess you probably saw the announcement, all the videos are up to date now. Everything's up to date on both iLearn and YouTube. Um, so we get all the matrix elements and have the spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian. And uh, this is what they look like in our original basis, um, you know, in terms of the X, Y, and Z. And so before we did all this work, uh, this is the AA block, just the A atom coupling to itself down the diagonal, if you just look at the diagonal elements, that's what we had before, is epsilon s. Well, I guess I wrote it here with an s star, which we haven't talked about. So you'll see this, and I think I'm going to do this in the last homework assignment, um, have you actually calculate the band structure of, I haven't decided, probably silicon. Um, and to get that x value right, you need this extra s star state. It's an excited what it represents is an excited S state. So, you know, we've just been using the sp3 orbitals of the valence shell. But if you want to be more accurate, you can use, start using orbitals of the empty shells up above. And people do that all the time. And you have to do that in silicon to get the x value right. And um, if, if you don't have this, if you just use your sp3 basis that we've been using, um, what happens is that X value is way too high. And so you know how levels tend to, when they couple, they push apart. So out at the X, if you have this extra S orbital up here that's above everything, and it couples to the P, then it pushes that down and gets it about the right energy where it should be. So this represents the S star. You'll see this in quantum chemistry codes. They always represent it as like a, a star. So it's an unoccupied from the next shell up is what it represents. Um, and I, I've kind of left that out because it's just, just one less thing to have to talk about. But if we're going to really you know, calculate the band structure of silicon, then we're going to have to include this. So you might as well know ahead of time what this thing is. At any rate, back to spin orbit coupling, um, you know, what's down the diagonal, these epsilon p's, I'm afraid to write. Um, or what we had before, and then all these other matrix elements came out of the spin over coupling. And it looks kind of messy in this S XYZ basis. It doesn't look very pretty. But now if you go to that our new basis, that JM, that total angular momentum basis, oops, you go to that new basis, then your Hamiltonian looks like this. This is our JM basis, the total angular momentum basis. And um, I've written it for both, this is the whole thing, that both the A and the B, B atoms. Um, so these are the four blocks from the three half states. And notice the way I've written this, I'm just, you know, I have the A atom and then the B atom, the A atom, the B atom. And I have the same, if you look closely, the same uh, state on each one of them. And as we talked about before, the, the, the matrix elements that couple the A atom to the B atom only couple the states with the same uh, JM quantum numbers, the same, same total angular momentum quantum numbers. You know, if we just looked at the AA block or the BB block, it's completely diagonal in this basis. And the three half states get raised up by a factor of delta, by delta over three. And the one half, the J equal one half states these two guys down here get lowered by this negative 2 delta over 3. And so we've, we've broken this, uh, this degeneracy, this six-fold degeneracy into uh, a four-fold, the four red blocks here, which are from the uh, four three-half states, and the um, a two-fold degeneracy due to the uh, uh, J equal one half states. Okay, so that's as far as we got 
last time. And this is, this is, you know, only, it's only this simple at um, k equals zero. So this is only true for k, this form for k equals zero, right, at gamma. Okay. This is the only time it gets so simple. Otherwise, you get a lot more matrix elements. Okay, so this is what we spent, I don't know, a long time getting to this point to understand what the spin over coupling does. Any questions? So now I'll just draw some pretty pictures. And I think this file is getting kind of big, so I'm going to start. Oh, let's see. I can put all the spin orbit coupling on one file here. The spin orbit coupling, it splits this six fold degeneracy that we initially had into um, a four fold and a two fold. And this four was going to, it will become your light hole and heavy hole bands. And this two will be your, your split off band. So this was down, this, this is the one that got lowered by negative two delta over three. And this is, these are the two that got raised by delta over three. So we started off, everything was at epsilon sub p and then the light hole and heavy hole get raised up by delta over three. And that split off band gets lowered by negative two delta over three. And so the total splitting is delta. And if we then look sort of pictorially at what happened um, before we turned on the uh, spin orbit coupling, we just had three bands that were completely degenerate at gamma. And so you have, they're all, all have the same energy right at the gamma point. So if I include spin, this is our six fold degeneracy at gamma. And now when I turn on the spin over coupling, um, I raise up uh, two of the bands by delta. One will be the heavy hole, one will be the light hole, and then I low, so they're raised up by delta, and then this, this band down here is lowered by two delta. And this is your split off band. Guys lowered down by two delta, two thirds delta. And it's your split off band, split off. Looks like spin orbit. That's your split off band. These guys are raised up by delta over three. And you've got your heavy hole and your light hole, light hole bands. The heavy hole band, you haven't proved this or derived it, but it is, in fact, the uh, three halves plus or comes from the three halves plus or minus three half states. And the, uh, the light hole, well, it has to come from the other two because they all are j equal three halves. So it's three halves plus or minus one half. And then the split off comes from the j equals one half. Is it degenerate reality? I'm sorry, what's that? Is it degenerate reality? Which ones? Uh, the upper one. Yeah, right at k equals zero. But what about the Pauli exclusion? Well, I mean, the Pauli exclusion principle just says that you can only put, you know, one electron in a state. But if I, if I have, it doesn't say that I can, it doesn't say anything about how many states I can have at the same energy. Right? That's just degeneracy. Just like in a particle in a box, you know, the first level is not, in like a two-dimensional box, the first level is non-degenerate. And then, you know, as you go up, you start having, you know, multiple ways you can, you can make a state, and, you, and your energy levels start to be degenerate. It's like you can have, uh, what is it? So, no. Kx, uh, one direction kx can be 2 pi, over, 2 pi over lambda, the other can be pi over lambda, and then you can switch it, and the energy is identical to two different states. All the states share one of them. What's that? All the degenerate states share one electron. No. Every state can have one electron. Every state can have one electron. And they're, remember, they're orthonormal, too. 
Those states are orthonormal. You can have four of states. You can have four electrons. Yeah. Are four electrons be the same energy? Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, one, I mean, one sort of stupid example is if my states are just spatially a million miles apart and they're at the same energy. I can have two electrons in them. That's like two atoms far apart. Same energy. Two electrons. But if we have a correlation, they begin to split. What's that? But if we have any correlation, they begin to split. Well, if there's, you need, for splitting, you need a non-zero matrix element between them. So you'd have to have something that gives you a non-zero matrix element between the states to split them. And if for, you know, due to symmetry reasons or whatever, you may not have that. You know, there's, I mean, the, going with the hydrogen atom is just a great example. You know, you, you, I, you, if you go through it in detail, you get that, you know, fine structure splitting and but you know you have to take into account extra stuff to, and, and those splittings can be very tiny too. So I mean these so these 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 guys, which are in this model completely degenerate. I mean they you can basically think of them as like two orbitals and two spins per orbital. I mean that's how we start. We start with two orbitals and two spins each. So specifically at k equals zero. Uh, these states, the heavy hole state, minus, and this is on the A atom, minus, and this would be for silicon where both atoms are identical, three halves. And this is on the B atom. Um, and the same form then holds for all of them, for the light hole and the split off. All right. And, um, you know, these are the, our valence, these are our valence bonding states. And so usually you think, you know, it's the same thing that happened when we were just dealing with this straight with the p orbitals. Usually you think of a bonding state as being like the sum of the two, being a symmetric uh, uh, combination. But because these things are anti-symmetric to begin with because they're p orbitals, um, you know, it's the anti-symmetric combination of anti-symmetric states which gives you this symmetric state under inversion. So these guys are symmetric under inversion and they are the bonding states. Um, they're also called U and Car Cardona, one of the uh, books listed in the syllabus. They use a lot of uh, uh, group theory notation and you'll, you know, if you ever start looking at EK plots in the literature, you'll quickly run into this kind of stuff. So these are referred to as the gamma four B states in U and Cardona. Um, for direct gap material, the conduction band just stays that is un unaffected by all of this. Keep our old basis of just S up and S down. Same thing with the down. So nothing changed there. And these are the uh, referred to as the gamma one C states. Again, if you look in U and Cardona, which you know at this point you may start to understand some of what's in that book. Okay, so in that is, and actually the, these are the states that form. Well, well, in a moment we'll start talking about k dot p theory. Well, I guess that wraps this up. So what we're going to start is k dot p theory sort of a whole different approach to band structure. So <clears throat> this is used extensively in optoelectronics. So for example, the, um, have you all heard of a quantum cascade laser? You've heard of a quantum cascade. You did a paper, you did your thesis on it, didn't you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, quantum cascade laser, it's a very, so a quantum cascade laser is probably the most sophisticated heterostructure that's ever been built for and you know actually made it into sort of the commercial realm. Um, it's made out of all direct gap 3-5 materials. They have to get very, very close good band alignments. They use multiple quantum wells, barriers, 
And to get all the band alignments correct, they use quaternaries, which means alloys consisting of four different materials like indium, aluminum, gallium phosphide, and stuff like that to get their band, all the band gaps and energy alignments correct. And all that design of those devices was done using k.p methods. And because, well, it's an optoelectronic device, and everything of importance happens right around gamma, at the gamma valley. And so k.p theory is really good for direct gap materials if all you care about is stuff uh, near the gamma valley. So um, this is great for, I mean, the people in optoelectronics, they deal exclusively with direct gap materials, such as your gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, etc. And so you're only interested in states near gamma. Um, unlike what we just did, where, which is good for the whole Brion zone, can capture the entire Brion zone. Uh, this is a perturbation theory, and you start with the known band structure uh, at the band edges at gamma, which we've just calculated in gory detail. And then you use, so this is all at k equals zero, and you assume you know the states at k equals zero, which we do because we just calculated them. Uh, and then you use perturbation theory to describe the bands as k moves away from zero. So as k moves away from zero, you're sort of dealing with that through something like a perturbation theory. And it's really what you call an envelope. You're really solving for the envelope of the wave function. Um, so you know we solved what we were just calculating in our localized orbital. We got. Um, we're actually calculating the form of those underlying block states that get repeated every unit cell. Here, you start off with the block states at gamma, and then everything is written as a linear combination of those block states as you move away from K. So your basis is your, um, your, eight, yeah, your eight block states. So at uh, K equals zero, that's sort of the, if you think of sp3 on each a and b atom, we had eight states to begin with, and um, that's your initial starting point, those eight states that we just calculated. And then to understand, as k moves away from zero, you then write you know, the new eigenstates as a linear combination of these eight eigenstates at k equal to zero. People used to get into heated arguments about things like you really can't take into account inter in this theory interfaces really well because say an MBE grower can grow a quantum well or grow uh, a crystal that, you know, like gallium arsenide for example. So the surface or the, if you're growing a quantum well could terminate on the arsenic atom or it could terminate on the gallium layer, because they grow in layers, gallium arsenic, gallium arsenic. And if you're doing an atomistic model, like we did in, in, the, in our localized orbital, then that's all automatically taken into account. But in this, you really don't have any information about the individual atomic layers, because you're using as your, your, um, your basis state these, these bulk states at the gamma point, uh, which, you know, are just a... a uh, a linear combination of the A and the B atom. So you can't handle things like, you know, what I just talked about, whether your quantum well ends on a gallium or an arsenic atom. So it's not really as um, good with handling interfaces or when you go to just large scale three-dimensional uh, calculations, if you're using an atomistic model, like what we've been doing, then you can imagine interfaces which just are a mix, say if you're going from gallium arsenide to indium arsenide. Um, you could have an interface, uh, a layer which is a mix of gallium and indium atoms. Right? And that's in, in fact what happens when you grow it, depending on how you grow it. 
And so you can explicitly put in some, you know, random distribution of indium and, uh, yeah, of uh, indium and gallium atoms, and just explicitly solve it in your in your localized orbital in an atomistic model. And, and here you, you really can't. But you know, it's it's really um, worked well for people doing uh, de designing lasers, and these quantum cascade lasers. It's been very powerful. And um, also, it allows you to um, work with smaller matrices. So, it numerically, uh, if you can get away with it, it's cheaper, a cheaper way to go, which we'll see as we get into this. Okay. Um, so, it's really sort of an en envelope function, the envelope how much each of these states is weighted rather than getting into the individual um, atomic orbitals. One of the key things, key parameters, just like in our, our tight binding theory, we actually had a lot of parameters, you know, like VXX, VSP, which at the end of the day are usually just chosen empirically to give you, you know, the right band gaps and effective masses, which are known experimentally. Here, the important sort of parameter, one of the key parameters, is the interband momentum matrix element. And this is something that's just empirically determined. But it's sort of a, a core, it's sort of a key thing. I mean, k dot p, this p is what we're talking about in the k dot p. This, this p is this essential central parameter to this theory. And once you have this P, another reason that it's really nice for optoelectronic work is that this is the same momentum matrix element you need to calculate all optical transitions. To calculate optical transitions, you need the matrix element of the momentum operator. And so you immediately have it sort of built into the heart of this theory. Whereas in the localized orbital type binding theory, it's kind of, there have been many papers written about how to appropriately calculate the momentum matrix element in your tight binding theory. I mean, if you really start to think about it, we kind of never really talked about the momentum matrix element, right? We wrote, and so in tight binding, in our localized orbital type binding theory, we just wrote down a Hamiltonian of p squared over 2m plus, you know, some sum of all the atomic potentials, you know, for each, for each atom. But now, and we, you know, we took the matrix element of that, we got parameters, and then we sort of parameterized it. But now if I say, okay, given, you know, some s on the a atom, px on the b atom, what is the momentum matrix element. Nobody really knows. There's been lots of papers written on the appropriate way to do this. But you'll see in this k dot p theory, it just kind of, it's obvious. Okay, and again, this is, you know, if you want to do optical transitions, this is what you're looking for. Um, okay, so let's just get going here. Um, so we are going to be considering a direct gap semiconductor, and uh, so which means, well, for us, I mean, you can have, as we've seen, a direct gap with band edges at, say, the X point, like in our polyacetylene, but we're going to assume that our band edges are at K equals zero, direct gap material like gallium arsenide, and you assume that the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, i.e. the block functions, are known at k equals zero, and they actually form the basis in which you work. And so these, you know, we just calculate it with and without spin orbit coupling. Right? So without spin orbit coupling, which is actually the way they do this in k dot p theory, they use, you're going to have, your basis will be um, the, the p orbitals, and um, the s orbitals at k equals zero. And then they'll, they'll put in spin over coupling explicitly. 
So you assume you know these, which we do now. We've gotten pretty good with this stuff. And then, well, now we just, let's go and write down our Schrodinger's equation and then start manipulating it. P squared over 2m, acting on psi. I'll explain this index. Where n is your band index, right? We were, we're using these known uh, band states that we just calculated as our basis. And that's equal to the energy of that band, which say it's your valence band or conduction band, times the wave function again. Okay, that's just Schrodinger's equation. And so the known solution has the block form, and the block form of any well, block function is periodic, some periodic uh, part, which repeats every unit cell, and then the plane wave multiplying it. So cyan that's going to equal the periodic part of it, U N R times the plane wave. But recall this is at k equals zero, right? So at k equals zero, we don't need to worry about that. And this u is periodic, and so u n, where r is your usual lattice vector. And these, I mean, these these things form a complete orthonormal basis as usual. So u n r e to the i k dot r. And this is the basis we're going to use in k.p theory, okay? So what we do is we put one of these, we just wrote down Schrodinger's equation, and now we just replace psi with this guy right here. So wherever we saw psi in our Schrodinger's equation, we're going to put in this, because we know this is a form of psi, okay? So let's, we'll go ahead and do that. And that's just equal e times the same thing again. And e will also have the indices for the band index. It's a function of k times u again. Okay, I just replaced everywhere I had psi with this special form of psi of a block function. And then what we do is we evaluate the, that p squared term, which you know, the p squared term is um, minus h bar squared over 2m grad squared, hitting everything to the right. right. That's what that p squared term is. And so that acts on everything to the right, which is our u. So this has spa the u has some spatial dependence. And the e to the i k dot r has space. So it's going to hit both of those things, right? You've got to use the product rule. And you've got to do it twice because it's grad squared. And so it takes a few lines, you know, first to do. And, you know, you can think of it as ddx and just do it in 1D if you like. But you, um, so you crank that out in page 6-3 of the PDF notes if you want to see the details of working that through, the tedious details. So right, you just apply it twice to that u e to the i k dot r, u e to the i k dot r term. And what you finally get is um, p squared over 2m. So when I close the parentheses, I mean it does not act on the e to the i k dot r now. Plus 2 times h bar k over 2m dotted into p, which is, again, only acting on the u term with an e to the i k dot r sitting out here, and plus the last term, uh, h bar squared k squared over 2m u e to the i k dot r. So that's what I get from, you know, applying grad squared twice to this product of u times e to the i k dot r. I have, I still have, whatever I got, I'm still going to have a v times u times e to the i k dot r. I'll also, just going along for the ride, I continue to have my v u e to the i k dot r. And all that is equal to on the right hand side this, which doesn't change, right? And so if you notice, every term has this phase factor 
on both the left hand side and the right hand side, right? It's no longer being acted on. You see that yellow? Does that show up at all? Let me try something a little bolder here. Red. How about red? Every every term now has this phase factor in it, which is now outside of the derivatives on both the left and right hand side. And so you can cancel that phase factor out from everything. And uh, now you just have an equation for the u, the periodic part of the block function. And if you look, here we have a k dot p, hence the name of the theory. We picked up something new that wasn't in Schrodinger's equation before. Before, you know, before we had this term, you know, we still have a p squared over 2m acting on u. Um, we get this extra, this is just a number now that depends on k, right? It's just this free particle energy, h bar squared k squared over 2m, parabolic type energy, act multiplying u. We've still got the potential multiplying u. So all these look like terms that you could end up with in Schrodinger's equation. But what's completely new we haven't seen before is this k dot p term. Hence the name of the theory. And so if we finally write all this out, the equation for u that we have, uh, p squared over 2m uh, plus h bar k dot p over m plus h bar squared k squared over 2m plus your crystal potential is periodic potential due to the whole crystal acting on u is equal to the energy times u. And so this is our starting point for k dot p theory. And everything, you know, if you just saw this, okay, you've got this funny, this is a little strange, I mean, but it looks just like some, you know, parabolic kinetic energy term proportional to k squared. All right, and this, you've always been dealing with this term right from the beginning. That always shows up in the Schrodinger equation. Your potential, well, that's always there, but this is this new thing, this k dot p term. And now let's talk about perturbation theory and what you can get out of this, some of the relationships you get from this equation. So we're going to use, we use perturbation theory to calculate are, are k-dependent energies for each band and so en of k and our new um, block functions, the u functions, u n k, in terms of what they were at k equals zero, which are your, the, your sort of the known quantities that you start with. So this is, I mean, you know, when we were solving our 8 by 8 Hamiltonian and tight binding, we were just, we were also calculating the periodic part of the block function. The part gets, gets repeated, and um, those are the coefficients right, that you calculate from that 8 by 8 matrix in the tight binding approach. And then to get the full wave function, you multiply those coefficients by that block sum basis, which has that e to the i k dot r built into it. And so it's sort of the same thing here. Okay, so let's look at the first order correction to the energy. The perturbing terms, I mean, what, we start with the, um, this equation at k equals zero. So at k equals zero, right, these terms are not there. These two terms are zero at k equals zero, right, because they have a k in them. Right? Those two terms are not there at k equal to zero. So at k equal to zero, this just looks like your Schrodinger equation. Your normal old Schrodinger equation. P squared over 2m plus v acting on u equals e times u. It's your starting point. And then we're going to treat these terms. So these are the terms you treat with your perturbation theory. To, to ask how do things change as k starts to become non-zero. Right? Because it's... For small k, those are small perturbations, and so you can use perturbation theory. The first order correction 
to EN0 is ENK is equal to EN0 plus H bar over M uh, K dot matrix element. The only operator in there is P. K is just a number. Right? K is K. It's not an operator. The operator is P, the momentum operator, which is your grad. So you, uh, it's you got to take this momentum matrix element N zero P N zero. And well, what about this term? That has a K in it, but that's second order in K, and we're doing first order perturbation theory. So you only include terms which are first order in the thing you're perturbing with. That's why for first order perturbation theory, that term is not there. The only first order term in K is that K dot P term, right? It's the only term first order in K. So do you all remember first order, first order perturbation theory? That's, I mean, the change in energy, delta E, in case you've already forgotten Karatkov's course. Right? Delta E is, um, in this case, you know, it's a change in energy, E n k minus E n zero, right? That's our delta E. And that's just the matrix element of your wave function with whatever your perturbation is. So n zero and whatever your perturbation is, usually in perturbation theory they'll call it like H prime, some perturbing part of your Hamiltonian. Does that look familiar? Okay, that's what we're doing, right? And our H prime is this k dot p term. Right? That's all we're doing. First order perturbation theory. And I guess uh, that's about all that we have time to do, too. So, um, yeah, well, we'll pick it up here on uh, Wednesday.